what we'll now talk about is the global financial crisis. So over here, what we have done is, so let's, uh, yeah, so, so let's start with the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis. Okay. Now, when I talk about the global financial crisis, right? So, how did it occur? So, before I go into this, right, I just uh, talk about a very famous phrase which which I read once, right? So, so, Seva and Umesh might uh, associate with this, right? So, this, uh, so I, I, I read this in one of the, uh, you know, way back, this is 2009, 9, 10, immediately after the global financial crisis had struck and, you know, the housing bubble had burst and all these things had happened, right? I, I, I read a journal, uh, a journal paper, right? And the first line of that journal was, uh, it was a paper on the global financial crisis and the first line of the paper was uh, Wall Street never seems to learn from experience. So, so basically what happens is that every time, you know, so Wall, Wall Street always works like a phoenix. So it starts, it rises up from its own ashes, right? It flies high, it creates, returns back to ashes and again it rises up from there. Right, and this has been the history of the American markets for a long period of time, right? And this is what I'm talking about very technically and academically. I, uh, so not much from the demographic perspectives. Look into the American history, right? So uh, no, not only the American history, but uh, what I mean to say the, the American history of the financial markets. Uh, <clears throat> from say, so let me leave aside uh, the Great Depression. I'm not going into that 1929. I'm just talking about a more recent America, so which is around say 1980s, right? So if you have uh, 1980s, you see there's the Black Friday, which is the biggest stock market crash that America has ever faced in the 1987. This was followed by the next big thing in America, which was the dot com bubble. Now you, as you, so you rise from that crash of 1987 and end up, and you move into that hysteria created by the dot com boom in the mid 90s, right, 95, 96, and that's where your stock markets are again soaring, uh, you know, very fast, and they are escalating at any any rates, and anything is happening around that point, and then. Uh, then there comes a market correction and you again go down into ashes and your markets crash losing around 80% of their overall valuation, right? So from there, from there, uh, what happens is uh, you enter into a, uh, you get a stock market hit, you go down the, so, so, so your, your stock market is down and then what happens is 9-11 happens, right? And the American economy enters into a recession. Right. So, uh, Seva and Umesh, do correct me if I am wrong. Right. So, this is what my reading of the American cycle is. So, if you have any other points to add on, please feel free to, or correct me if I go wrong somewhere. So, <clears throat> so America enters into a recession once again. Right. Now, America needed a way to get out of this recession, and it was 2001, 2001, 2002. Right, so immediately after the 9-11 crash, uh, the, the 9-11 event, right, the World, uh, the World Trade Center crash, uh, America entered into a recession. And this is where, you know, within this recession itself, and the strategy that America had taken to come out of that recession 
contained the seeds of the next crisis, right? So what happened was that uh, America needed a very, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, they needed a very great idea to pull Americans out of recession. And Americans have never, uh, you know, like uh, they have never, they, they always wanted a very shortcut way to pull things out because by by these Americans are actually very smart. Right. So what they did was they started uh, tweaking on the uh, the Keynesian policies. Right. So in 1929, in the Great Depression, right, the, the Keynesian theory, the, the, the you know, a very core theory on recession management and recession combat was created, which was created by uh, some of the George, uh, Lord Maynard. Keynes, so John uh, Maynard Keynes, right? Now, <clears throat> now what Keynes had said was that if you need to fight an economy out of recession, uh, right, you need to boost up the aggregate demand and you need to do it through the consumption channel. So once your consumption expenditures are boosted, so more and more people go and they try to, the, as people start buying things, right, the more the demand for the things would come up and <clears throat> the more uh, production would happen and the economy would gradually uh, accelerate its way out of the recession. Now, what America did was, America took this part, right? And they saw that in most of their consumption stores in the region, within the stores of the retail giants, there was huge amount of inventory which was there. And the first thing that America did was, America cut down the rate of interest of their consumption loans. And if I'm not mistaken, the Fed had cut it down to 1% or something like that. So it was a very negligible interest uh, what they used to charge. Now the moment this happened, right, in the initial stages of the, this, this strategy was a great strategy, right. A cut of the interest rate had stimulated the consumption in the American economy. And what people started doing was people started getting crazy about uh, the thing and they started their shopping under shop for America banner. Now London Times reported this event right where they say that under the shop for America banner people were not buying consumption goods because of their necessities they were buying it out of patriotism right. So they wanted to buy so much that America escalates out of this recession and that's what they primarily started doing and up to this point the strategy was perfect. And people were buying things and inventories were rushing down and uh, the transactions happened and credit expanded and everything started happening. But <clears throat> then something happened which was, which created a trigger going down the lane, a, a, a few years down the lane. So what happened was this boom it spread to the housing segment as well. Right, and <clears throat> America started designing, or and the bank started designing something called the subprime loans. Right, so every loan has a prime lending rate. If you're lending below that rate, that's a subprime rate, right? And <clears throat> and these loans were given to people without sufficient affordability matrices. So the affordability matrices were not kind of a concern for these people who are buying these loans, right, or uh, for the banks. Right, so, so, so the banks wanted uh, these people to, you know, kind of were, uh, so, so, <clears throat> So America wanted people to buy uh, by this consumption goods as well as this free fled to houses. Now, how did uh, these people they finance their consumption? So what many people did was they bought a so the, when they were getting a home at a uh, subprime rate, they brought a home right on loan, and <clears throat> using that. Uh, so now what happens is that every time over the, over time the equity value of the houses go up, right, or the, or, the, or the market prices of the houses go up. Now, when there's a unidirectional increase in the housing prices, 
you can actually use your house as an asset right to run down that uh, so you can actually use your house as an asset to borrow some more amount on that so 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 the additional increase in the equity value that has happened right so you can actually loan that amount against the house and you can actually buy other consumption goods and several banking products can be designed around those however in doing that one very important metric which the bankers did not take into care or take into account and the regul neither the regulators were interested in taking care of it was that housing prices would not go up forever they would hit a level and then they would stumble down right so if you look into the case the, the case uh, Schiller index right the the the, the cs uh, housing price index the case uh, case Schiller housing price index you will see that there was a sudden plunge in the housing prices on the from the end to the end of 2000 for beginning of 2005 uh, 2005 right <clears throat> and when housing prices started coming down the banks realized that they had lent out more than they had because one very important critical part is that the bank should be able to recover the loans by selling the houses right? so in case of a default when a mortgage loan if there is a default the borrowers will take up the bank will take up this part and they'll say okay fine uh, I'll, I'll take your house i'll sell it off and i'll make i recover my dues but for doing that but for doing that and to prevent the loss you must have a housing price right which is the or, or equity price of the house must be such that that it is less than equal to your loan just to break even but over here what you have done is against the house you have given out much more loan and when the, when the market correction you realize the amount of loan that you have given against the house is where was much more than the equity value of the house and now you know that even if you go ahead and then sell the house <coughs> you're not going to make anything out of it now even when you go to sell the house there is such a lack of there is such an excess supply that you may not be able to sell the house so so selling the house itself would become a big question so from this perspective what we try to do is or what we think of doing is we now realize the, or the banks now realize that <clears throat> a huge amount of loan has been given to a highly risky segment which cannot be recovered. And the banks are stuck with a whole set of risky loans. And this is where, you know, this is where the uh, <clears throat> your uh, investment banks step in. And they start creating, so they buy these loans and they start creating very colorful instruments, colorful assets out of this, uh, of these, uh, out of these loans and they convert them into different financial assets like credit default swaps, uh, so, so, sorry, <clears throat> so they create a different kind of these assets, right, so they create CBOs, they create uh, derivatives out of this and they issue it as they start issuing it to the global investors right so in a way what happened was this entire loss which would which the which was you know uh, confined with the u.s economy was spread to the entire world right and <clears throat> when people realized that that these assets were not worth it and they could money which these assets could not be really covered the return of these assets could not be given that's where the entire system plant. So, so this the, the shock that was generated within the American system or in the American, the American economy had been spread to the world all over. And when this spread, and when this particular thing spread, <coughs> banks uh, now now one option for the investment banks was to go for, was just to collapse, right? So. Just to go bang down, right? The one that happened to Lehman Brothers. I'm not going into the details and integrities of it. So it's I'm just talking about the chain, right? The banks did not have sufficient amount of capital. However, from the government's perspective, the government cannot let the banks collapse, otherwise the entire system 
may collapse and the entire currency will lose its value. Because if there's a question on the banking system, so the bank, the government had to support the bank and has to bail them out of it. Now, when they bail you out of it, right? So they are actually using the taxpayers' money. And in America, you use taxpayers' money in, uh, for such purposes and not for public uh, projects, right? Or for growth projects is a very negative thing. And <clears throat> and that showed that the present government, within the present government, the regulators, the government, the policymakers, no one was there. No one was there to support it. No one was there to play, uh, you know, kind of, no one was there to prevent this economy from collapsing. Because no one had actually identified these challenges or even if they had identified the lack of regulations, anything, but because of the game that was going on, everyone had just let it go, <clears throat> right? And this marked the end of your Alan Greenspan era. So this is famously known as the end of the Greenspan era. So what Alan Greenspan, the then governor, governor of the Federal Reserve, used to tell or used to believe was that you let bubbles grow, right? Rather than preventing bubbles, preventing bubbles, the cost that you incur by preventing bubbles is much lower than that you let it by flourishing and then controlling it. So, they, so and that's the reason why, you know, America had gone through a lot of bubbles during that period of Alan Greenspan while he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Right. Now, <clears throat> after that, after that, so what, what was there was that, you know, the, the increase in the risk was extreme over these periods, right? So what we wanted to, so so basically now what happened? So now how is it that this concept of unexpected loss is coming? Let's take for the case, let's take an example of ICICI Bank, right? So at that point of time, Mr. Chanda Kochar was the CEO of uh, ICICI Bank, right? And what she had done was, and what ICICI Bank had done was, ICICI Bank had decided to kind of invest a lot into these securities, right? And after a point of time when they realized that it was not worth it and that the value should not be realized, the economy went through a very bad crash. I mean, <clears throat> ICICI faced a very huge setback at that point of time, right? And when they faced and when, you know, <clears throat> it was there, uh, and so how to put it? Yeah. So when ICICI would have received the shock, right? That would have been an unexpected shock, right? And the loss that they would have gained or uh, they would have incurred through it would be an unexpected loss because this is something which is not coming originally from their lending behavior, right? Now ICICI knows to whom have they given, how will they collect collected, and what would be done. So. So they have a total understanding of the entire thing, right? Now what they want to do is, now what they would want to know is, they would want us to know that how is it that this uh, entire thing is, uh, so how would you know or how would you have an understanding that uh, this such thing is happening? So, so when this loss has been incurred, right, a huge shock has uh, a huge shock would have come to the bank, right? But if the bank was not adequately capitalized, it would not have been able to bear that cost, uh, bear that loss. So to bear that loss, you need to have that amount of capital kept aside from your. Uh, <clears throat> so you need to have that amount of capital to be kept aside. Such that when that shock comes in, you should be able to absorb that shock, right? So this unexpected loss, now the, at the magnitude at which the global financial crisis had happened, was a huge event, right? So you needed, so you need as a bank, you need capital to substantiate or to help you sail through these periods of shocks, which was not there. And following this period, now when what saw how bad the crisis could be and what impact it could have, what repercussions it could have, right? That's where this entire story of keeping aside capital came in, right? 
and this is where you know your global financial crisis your concept of and, and this is where banks realize that they need to have sufficient amount of capital especially to prevent themselves against unexpected loss and also if a stress situation actually arises would they would that capital that they have kept aside be sufficient to help them sail through that period of stress where a period of stress is rarely defined as a cycle of downturn <coughs> Right, so this is where you know. So this is what the global. So this is what was an example, or this is how you know an unexpected loss actually originates. Right, so it need not originate through this. Uh, what should I say? So it did not actually originate. Uh, it, it it would not originate through the common lending practices, but it would originate through some other channels apart from the lending practices. Now another typical example of this is. The you know an inbuilding fraud within the bank, right? So so it might be that you know the, the, the top tier of the bank is trying of a bank, the the, the 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 directors in the bank are swooping up a fraud, and when that comes to news, that's a huge loss to the bank, right? And you realize that okay, I had uh, I had invested into these so and so assets of of this particular counterparty or this counterparty bank, and there's a huge fraud which was developing over there, and I and I lose all my money. So and that's where the shock comes in, and to prevent yourself against that, you need to have a capital kept aside, as a buffer to absorb those shocks, right? So this is precisely what an unexpected loss is, and to capture this unexpected loss, we have these accords, we have these Basel accords, we have these behavior, uh, so we have these. Um, well, the stress testing norms and so on. Over here, <clears throat> so now the next thing that we want to that we will talk about is how is it that this global financial crisis, or how is it that once this crisis was over, how did these other regulations, or or what happened when these regulations started coming? Because global financial crisis uh, was, as we say, a typical example of an unexpected loss. case of an unexpected loss right now this was more severe what made the impacts of this global crisis global financial crisis more severe was the existence of the G C fees the globally systematically important financial institutions the G C fees right so this is what so this is where the role of so this is what or the existence of these globally systematically important financial institutions made the entire difference or this is what created the or you know this is what made global financial crisis even more severe and because of these gcps it became absolutely important to maintain these basel accords